Hello, 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 everybody. Um, this is super impromptu, and this may never go up, but I'm deep in my emotions right now, and I wanted to use my outlet. And uh, if you are only here for the diamond painting content and you don't care um, about the person behind the creator making the content, um, this isn't the video for you. And that's totally okay, too, because I know there are a lot of people who come and stay here because they want to hear what's going on in my life, my kiddo's life, um, and things like that. So, uh, as many of you know, my daughter was born with an airway disorder, and it has been a constant struggle for three years now to get anyone to do anything and um, probably should be in my phone today we finally got my daughter scheduled for um, a second opinion and we will be driving two and a half hours each way, out of state, to go to a doctor who specializes in this and has expertise in this. And I know I look super, super sad because I'm sitting here crying. Um, but to be honest with you, I couldn't be any happier. For those who don't know, my daughter was diagnosed around three months old with laryngomalacia, which means uh, softening or floppy larynx. Um, there are four kinds of malacia. You have laryngomalacia, tracheomalacia, bronchomalacia, pharyngomalacia, and they are of the four different depths of the airway. Um, if I have a cool graphic, I'll throw it up. Otherwise, um, I will leave... Research links and things like that down below if you have any interest in reading up on this. Um, if you ever have any questions at all, please feel free to reach out to me. All of my contact information is down below um, or leave it in the comment section and I can answer it publicly. Uh, what it looked like for us, my daughter sounded like a pug from the moment she was born. And we said something in the hospital and they told us, this is normal. This is normal newborn breathing. She was born really quickly. She swallowed too much amniotic fluid. She'll be fine. That This is totally normal. And then we went home and it didn't get any better. And we would spend all day long trying to feed her a bottle. She never nursed. Um, she couldn't latch. Probably part of this as well. And for us, um, we were written off so many times because we're first time parents. What will we know? We were told the noisy newborn breathing and the regurgitation was normal. She might have subglottic, subglottic stenosis. She doesn't. Um, it could be allergies. It's not. This is normal. It's not. Um, and so when she was three months old, we took her to the emergency room because she was having what's called retractions. To this day, my child is three and a half years old and she still has a tug right here at her, like where her trachea is. It's called a tracheal tug. There's two kinds of retractions you can have. Tracheal and then spacing on the name on it, but around the ribs. Uh, that was the only time I've ever seen her have the ones around the ribs. And I immediately took her to the hospital. And this was January or February, so it was like height of flu season. I had a newborn baby. Um... They took us in right away. Her breathing went back to normal. No more retractions. 
And then they told us, uh, your daughter, we suspect your daughter has laryngomalacia, and they gave us a sheet of paper. And we read it, and we cried, and not because we were scared, but because this sheet finally um, described everything that we had been dealing with. Let me put my phone on mute. Hold on. Okay. This is not a very professional video. Um, I also can't get the right angle, so, like, I'm, like, all up in the camera. Hey, guys. Anyway, so, we, um, got the unofficial diagnosis because you need to have an ear, nose, and throat, an ENT, uh, diagnose you. And the way that they diagnose you is they do a bedside scope. A little camera goes in the nose, down the throat, into the airway. So we had our appointment with the ENT. They confirmed that it was laryngomalacia. They told us it was mild and they sent us on our way. For nearly... Let me rewind. So they also noticed that we had reflux. You could see the irritation from the acid coming back up and the damage. Uh, reflux and laryngomalacia go hand in hand. Think of it this way. If it's irritated when you're trying to breathe, it makes it harder to breathe. And if you're having difficulty breathing, well, that just makes everything worse. So, we started her on reflux medication and we were sent on our way. And around that time, I put my foot down, um, and I know I keep looking down. I don't have anything here. I just, I feel really awkward looking at the camera because it's over here, but it looks like I'm looking that way. So I, I don't, <laughs> I never know where to look when I do a front facing video. Anyway, so our pediatrician at that point, we were on our second pediatrician who was a real asshole. Um, and is 100% the reason that we left that entire hospital clinic. Um, he had told us that everything we were dealing with was normal, even though my daughter had been diagnosed. Um, they told us she'll outgrow the airway disorder, the reflux, that'll be gone in a few months. It's not a big deal that your kid's turning blue. Um, you know, what would you know? I'm a doctor. I have a lot more knowledge than you. And I remember telling him, you might be a doctor, but you don't know my child. While I'm not an expert in medicine, I know something's not right with my kid. So I proceeded to put my foot down and I said, look, I'm tired of you telling me that it's normal for my child, who at that point was about four months old, um, taking about an ounce, ounce and a half in a bottle at a time. And we would spend an entire hour feeding her sometimes two hours and then you could see the signs of hunger and we would have to start all over again at that point I was pumping and if you know anything about pumping especially for a newborn you do it all the time I was pumping eight to twelve times a day and feeding her in between or wall I was pumping um, my husband as well. He was feeding the baby as well. And it felt like I got no sleep. Uh, my husband stayed up with her overnights for the first however many weeks her entire schedule was flipped. That's super common. If you've never had a child and you're, you're pregnant or you're thinking about having a kid, it's super, super common for babies to have their days and nights mixed up in the beginning. It does get better, but it's exhausting. So throw that in with a child who is burning more calories than she's consuming simply trying to breathe and is pushing away the bottle even though she's hungry because she has severe pain from uncontrolled and mismanaged reflux. I said, if you're not going to help me, give me a referral to somebody who will. And we started feeding therapy. And we made, we met an amazing speech language pathologist who was our feeding therapist through the therapy services at our local um, hospital. And she was amazing. And we stayed with her for 
uh, 18 months. And I'll come back around to this. And then uh, we spent two more months in the feeding clinic. Again, I'll come back to this. So all the while, we got sent back to the ENT for our follow-up. And she was about six months old there. And they said to us, well, her strider sounds much better. You guys can go. Never put a hand on her. Never scoped her again. Never even checked her vital. Like, nothing. Nothing. So, they sent us on our way. And that was it. So, there we were. Thinking, we're at the end of the road. Yay. And here we are three years later. Still dealing with it. In the interim, we've been to three different GIs, affiliated with four different hospitals. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the last one, okay, let's start. The first one uh, wanted us to do a gastric emptying scan to see if she had delayed emptying or gastroparesis. Uh, no gastroparesis, but we do have mild delayed emptying. But the problem is these tests are not made for children. They're made for, like, adults. So they're using the numbers based off of the adults. I don't really think that's part of our issue. But what he wanted to do was he wanted to put us on erythromycin, which is uh, a very common medication, an antibiotic. But it's a minuscule dose because it's not being used as an antibiotic. So problem was they don't make them that small and it would have been $800 a month after insurance. We let him know we can't afford that. Um, we can't afford to just try it one month and see if it works. And we certainly can't afford if this is the thing that makes the difference. So he told me, well, then you figure it out. What? What? I'm not a doctor. How am I supposed to figure it out? I can't get the medication for another price. I asked, is there something in a similar family that we could try instead? And uh, I never heard back from him. And I promptly took my daughter from that clinic. And I took her to the original children's hospital near us. Somebody pulled some strings and got us in to see the head of pediatric, pediatric gastroenterology. Who told us, there's nothing wrong with your child. She doesn't even have reflux. So, if you've ever been around a baby who has reflux, they spew everything. If you've ever been around an adult who has reflux, they don't usually spew anything. You can have silent reflux. You can have it coming up and hear the child swallowing it back down. You can hear the acidity in the burps. This is uh, something that scared the shit out of us, but it's not uncommon. When the acid in your stomach interacts with reflux medication, it can cause, we'll, call, we'll use the medical term here of purple emesis. That means our child had bright purple vomit more than once. And you wanna tell me she doesn't have reflux. Well then why is her stomach so acidic if she's not struggling from this? So we promptly left that one and found our third GI doctor, who is who we are with now. He has since transferred hospitals because the first hospital shut down their local office. And let me tell you, I, like a crazy lady, called the office and I said, oh my God, I need to know where is he going? Is he retiring? Because he's a little bit older. Sorry, my ear itches. And I'm trying to not be like, it's not working. Um, and we followed him to the new one. And he not only believes that we're still dealing with reflux, which I should probably specify, we have tried numerous times, three, four times, to get her off of her reflux medication. But when you have a child who is underweight and you watch them curled up in pain, lying on the floor screaming because it hurts so bad, but they don't want to eat or drink anything because it makes it hurt even worse. And then they drop weight. It's really, really hard to just sit there and continue to push through it. And we tried. We tried 
for a long time. If you know anything about reflux, there's a rebound period. We got through the rebound period and it was still not getting any better. So put her back on the reflux medication and here we are. So we are now scheduled to have an endoscopy. They suspect that she might have eosinophilic esophagitis. I want to see what's going on with the reflux. Because while it's normal that babies have reflux, it's not normal that babies continue to have reflux into their preschool years. And everyone kept telling us she'll not grow up by the time she's one. By the time she's 18 months old. By the time she's two years old. And then we hit two and nobody said anything anymore because I think they all knew. She wasn't going to just outgrow it if she hadn't already. So the second GI doctor that we saw wanted us to go to the feeding clinic. Why? I don't know. But he did. And he sent us. And the feeding clinic helps with kids who have feeding issues based on more psychological needs. Um, which was not the case for my daughter. My daughter didn't refuse food. Um, she just struggled to consume things safely. And it wasn't because her brain was telling her something. It's because she has dysphagia and laryngomalacia and, um, all these things. So all in all, we spent, um, I think it was 21 months under the care of somebody under the, the feeding umbrella. Uh, for those who are curious, she is fine with like a straw cup. She's fine with any foods. Uh, she still can't safely drink out of an open cup, but we don't push that too strong. Part of it is because I'm terrified. Uh, for those who don't know what aspirating means, it means that instead of the liquid going in your mouth, down your esophagus, into your stomach, that it branches off and goes either into the lungs or into the airway. And it can penetrate where it's just starting to go or it can go in and aspirate. You can end up with pneumonia. Uh, you can end up with lung damage. And every time my child had thin liquids, water, breast milk, juice, milk, she aspirated. So we thickened her feeds and I remember very distinctly going on a play date to a playground with a friend of mine whose daughter's the same age. And um, the mother has a slew of her own medical needs. So she was always very compassionate, compassionate to me and as understanding as someone can be for something they don't understand. Um, and my daughter had thickened water and thickened milk with her and she drank all of it and was still thirsty and she wanted my water bottle which just had regular water in it and I watched as she cried because she just wanted something to drink and I couldn't give it to her and I felt terrible I had to end the play date so we could go home because I didn't have anything else. I didn't have anything else to thicken with. I didn't have any liquids to thicken. I had people cancel play dates because they thought my kid was sick. Because they didn't understand. Because they didn't want to have to be more mindful of the things that were provided at their house. She couldn't have a juice box because I had to thicken it. She couldn't have little cartons of milk because I had to thicken it. And instead of saying, is there something that we can do to accommodate your child or did you plan on bringing your own things? They just stopped inviting us. So I have watched as having a medical child has affected relationships between me and other parents. How other parents have allowed it to affect their relationship between my child and their child. How it has affected my relationship with my husband and my family. And how it has shaped who I am as a mother. It 
if I didn't have a child who had any sort of medical needs, I'm not sure that I would be this fierce mama bear that I am. That I would take no bullshit from anyone. That I would fight to advocate for my child. That I would spend the phone, hours on the phone, calling the insurance company and the doctor's offices, trying to coordinate things. Find out why our nutritionist was taken away from us for coverage. Three appeals, by the way. To find out how many more sessions of feeding therapy I had. Could we change our schedule so that one wouldn't actually be in the same week? And that we wouldn't go three weeks without having feeding therapy. To make sure that my daughter had everything that she needed. All the different bottles and nipples. And different things to use to thicken her feeds. All the medical supplies that we needed. All these things to coordinate. And I wouldn't have been able to do this if I hadn't have been put in this position. If you have a friend who has a, a medically complex or fragile child, the worst thing you can do is pull away. And I know so many people in my life pulled away because they didn't know what to do. Just ask me. Ask me what you can do. Ask me if there's anything that you can do to help. Ask me questions about what we're going through. To the people in line at Target who told me, how dare you bring such a sick child out? I wish I had known you three years ago as this Lindsay. And I would have let you know that I'm so sorry that my daughter's soft airway offends you. I'm so sorry that my child struggling to breathe makes you think I'm a bad parent. I'm so sorry that she's so skinny and it offends you. I'm not here to look for pity or um, not even empathy. What I am here is to share my story so that if you're going through something, whether it's Lorengo Malaysia or not, to know that you're never alone. If you've been questioned as a parent because you're not a doctor, you are not alone. If you are a full-blown adult taking care of yourself and the doctors are telling you they're smarter than you, they have more knowledge than you, you are not alone. If you have ever had to fight for a loved one or for yourself, you're not crazy. You're not alone. You're, you are strong enough to do this. July 10th is World Airway Disorders Day. And in honor of that, I am asking everybody to paint their nails light blue. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you are. I don't care where you're from. I don't care where you're going. I'm just asking everyone to paint their nails light blue. Especially if you are with multiple people and your nails are light blue, people will ask and they will say, why are all of your nails light blue? Every single year, my husband and I and our daughter have had their, our nails painted light blue. It's much more of a conversation starter when my husband has his nails blue because most people question, why is a man wearing blue nail polish? Um, you don't need to be knowledgeable about something to raise awareness for it. You don't need to be an expert on something to be an advocate for it. I am here standing before you because I've been pushed into this position and it has changed who I am as a person. It has changed who I am as a parent. And I will forever be grateful to Coping with Larangle Malaysia for giving me the support that I needed, the resources and knowledge that I needed, and for giving me this platform and opportunity to spread awareness and educate. And I'm just asking you to do the same. If you or someone you know has a friend, family, coworker, somebody on the internet that is in the world of airway disorders, there are so many resources out there. There's an amazing group on Facebook for caregivers. Um, Coping with Lorango Malaysia, I'll leave all the information down below. They have a free ebook. They have 
questions to ask your ENT, your gastroenterologist. Um, they have a resource of recommended ENTs in, in your area. They have meetups across the world. They have virtual connections. So if you're looking for someone in your country, your state, your city, they have all of that available. And had it not been for them, I think my life as a parent would be very different. And um, I clearly wouldn't be sitting here making this video. So uh, if you guys have made it all the way through, I can't thank you enough. Um, I know this is not my typical kind of video, but I had a lot of things on weighing on my heart and we will be making the journey next month in the span of three days my daughter will have an endoscopy and a bedside scope and she will see her GI and we will get a second opinion on an ENT and I'm hoping that we find some answers so thank you guys so much for being here and I'll see you in my next one bye guys